Hello everyone, my name is Christian Benavides. Today we'll be discussing Rocket Nozzle Heat Transfer. Presenters include myself, Stephen Boyd, and Corey Mitchell. Today we'll be focusing on heat transfer in a converging diverging nozzle, methods of cooling, and special cases. Straight into it, to our left we can see an overall shape of a converging diverging nozzle. We can see the path of our flow from a subsonic region to a transonic region, and finally to a supersonic region. Let's look at the cross-section of our nozzle to our left. We can see a static temperature, static pressure, and gas velocity plot. If we focus on the temperature plot at the nozzle inlet, nozzle throat, and nozzle exit, we can see that the nozzle experience extreme temperatures at the inlet and the throat while the temperature drops throughout the diverging section of the nozzle. Even with the temperature drop, ordinary metals cannot withstand temperatures a nozzle will experience. With that, engineers have developed methods of cooling the nozzle and have averted catastrophic failure. Hi there, my name is Stephen Boyd and I'm going to be talking about the gas side of the heat transfer problem. Now the basic equation that we're going to be using should be pretty familiar to most of us at this point. And it gives us the thermal flux in the units of power per unit area from the gas to the nozzle at a given point along the nozzle length. Now the reason that we want to start with the gas side is because if we know the energy flux coming into our nozzle, then that tells us what kind of energy our nozzle needs to be getting rid of in order to remain in a steady state. If the flux coming into the nozzle is higher than the flux going out, then we are not in a steady state, and our nozzle will keep getting hotter until it melts. That's a bad thing. When the nozzle starts melting and enters the gas flow, we call that running engine rich. Okay, going back to this equation here, there are a number of different ways to model this. One of the simpler ways is with something called the Bartz method. Now this is about half of the main equation. That little sigma term on the end blows up into the other half. I'm not going to go too much into this equation because it's math, but just know that this thing exists and it's called the Bartz method. Once you've got your nozzle inputs and you've got some kind of heat model, whether that's the Bartz method or something else, you crunch the numbers and end up with something like this. This plot shows a number of different models, two of which use the Bartz method, plotted against experimental results. You can see that the Bartz method has fairly good agreement with the real values, and so it's a pretty good predictor for how the gas will actually behave. Another takeaway is the extreme thermal conditions present at the throat. This is the area of most intense heating, and nearly every rocket nozzle design needs some way to either reject that heat flux or withstand the very high temperatures for short burn durations. One method for handling the extreme environment at the throat, especially if you've got fairly short burn durations, is to use a nozzle insert made of special high temperature materials. Inserts are often single use, but because they're a separate component, it's much easier to swap out the insert than it is to replace the entire nozzle. Engines which use active cooling methods will often concentrate their cooling capacity around the throat and combustion chamber in order to handle the high temperatures and heat fluxes. Whether or not cooling is used, every nozzle needs to be able to handle the extreme environment created by the exhaust gases. So even though there's the issue of high heat flux in a rocket nozzle throat section, the waste heat produced from combustion is actually very beneficial and can drive the entire cycle, such as the expander cycle shown on the right. In this cycle, fuel, typically hydrogen, undergoes a phase change when it passes through the cooling jacket around a hot nozzle. Because of the phase change, it can expand against the turbine, which drives the pumps, which drives the entire engine. There is a limitation, however, known as the d squared law. Because thrust is proportional to characteristic throat diameter squared, but heat transfer is proportional to that throat diameter to the first power, there is a diminishing return effect where the heat transfer output is not enough to power the engine at a certain overall size, and so you get a maximum thrust value. This is why the expander cycle is typically used in space applications, where you don't really need much thrust but you need high efficiency. The RL-10 is an example of an engine using such a cycle. Some of the main methods for cooling a rocket nozzle are film cooling, ablative cooling, and regenerative cooling. In film cooling, a film of coolant or propellant is directed along the gas side wall boundary layer to protect wall material from direct combustion products. The film is introduced into the chamber from around the injector. In ablative cooling, gas side wall material is sacrificed by being burnt away, which carries heat away from the nozzle wall. Typically, you'll see ablative cooling used in smaller systems like hybrid rockets and with graphite nozzles specifically. 
In regenerative cooling, which is the most widely used in industry, the propellant is fed through passages in cooling jackets around the nozzle wall before being injected for combustion. Here's an image of a decommissioned rocket nozzle with regen cooling. This nozzle is actually at the Cal Poly Propulsion Lab, but I'm not sure what engine it's a part of. Maybe one of the TAs or Dr. Deterris knows. In the image on the left, you can see grooves on the inside of the combustion chamber, which are all tubes for coolant to flow axially down the chamber. The coolant in this case is just propellant, so probably RP1 or hydrogen, which enters the fuel inlet manifold, shown as the tube on the front end of the combustion chamber in the right image. The tubes wrapping around the nozzle extension section aren't coolant tubes, but are just structural braces. Back to the left image, the fuel inlet manifold directs coolant into the tubes, so that some coolant flows down some tubes, and some coolant flows up return tubes back into the chamber. The model for regenerative cooling in a nozzle considers heat transfer from the combustion products to the coolant across three main layers, as shown in the figure on the right. It considers forced convection across the gas side boundary layer, conduction through the chamber wall, and forced convection across the coolant side boundary layer. For this system, to calculate total heat flux, you can consider an overall heat transfer coefficient between the three layers, and you need to worry about the adiabatic wall temperature of the gas on the combustion side and the bulk temperature of the coolant. Generally for design, you want a low gas side heat transfer coefficient, but you want a high wall conductivity and a high coolant side heat transfer coefficient. The low gas side heat transfer coefficient allows for a steep temperature drop up to the wall, but the high wall conductivity allows for a low temperature drop across the wall, which will prevent thermal loading. An interesting point is that the coolant should be kept below its critical temperature or else a vapor film layer will develop on the coolant side, which will prevent proper heat flow. On to our first special case high temperature nuclear rockets. On the left you can see an image of a NASA concept. On the right you can see the NERVA project. The NERVA project was a real thermal nuclear rocket developed for space application. In collaboration between the AEC, Atomic Energy Commission, and NASA, was developed for over two decades. But what are the main differences between an NTR and a traditional chemical rocket? Unlike traditional rockets, NTRs flow their propellant into nuclear reactors that can reach up to 14,000 Kelvin. In addition, radiation must be considered with convection in the heat transfer due to the extremely high temperatures the gases will reach once they pass through the nuclear reactor. NTR's efficiency is significantly higher than chemical rockets. They were essentially designed for deep space missions like going to Mars. But with all that energy comes an extreme amount of heat. For instance, the heat flux experienced by the nozzle is 30 times that of a traditional chemical rocket. But as you'll see in the next slide, regenerative cooling is not the only way to contain extreme amounts of heat. For the final and last case, magnetic nozzles. In this image, you can see a concept design of a fusion nuclear thermal engine. This engine was designed for NASA's Discovery 2 spacecraft. On this engine, we can see a massive magnetic nozzle. But what are the main differences between a magnetic nozzle and a traditional converging diverging nozzle? Well, for starters, a traditional chemical rocket uses a converging diverging wall to accelerate the flow from subsonic to supersonic. In the image in the right, we can see a comparison between a converging diverging nozzle and a magnetic, no a magnetic nozzle. And the main difference between these two nozzles is a physical wall. While the plasma engine uses a magnetic field with the contour of a converging diverging nozzle, we essentially use a magnetic wall to constrict the plasma and accelerate charged particles from subsonic to supersonic. In this process, we are also converting thermal energy directly into kinetic energy. Now that's the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you everyone for listening.